Hello, thank you very much. And uh, let me just uh, say that it's a wonderful pleasure to uh, be with all of you today. And, uh, and I want to thank uh, the Department of Energy and all the leadership team uh, for inviting me uh, to participate in, in this great dialogue. Today, I thought I would spend the time uh, to share a series of reflections around the opportunity of creating a new quantum industry and uh, what it may entail uh, by means of brief introductions so that you know where I'm speaking from. Uh, I'm talking right now from, from this building. This is the IBM Research Headquarters, the TJ Watson Research Laboratory, uh, just about 45 minutes north of New York City, and it serves as the global headquarters of, of IBM Research. And as you know, many in the audience will know, uh, it's, been, it's also been a place that is, has, has played a very important role right, in, the, in the history of, of quantum information and in the, in the current moment that we find ourselves. I'll also um, you know, reflect first that we are indeed witnessing a, a historical moment. I like to say that this is the most exciting time in computing, I think since you know, the 1940s, since the advent of the first um, you know, programmable digital computers. Uh, you're seeing on the left a picture uh, of the Colossus machine in Bletchley Park in 1944. And in some ways we are witnessing over the last few years a similar moment where the first programmable uh, quantum computers have began to emerge. And that, you know, we have such an exciting journey, journey ahead and is in that light that uh, I want to also celebrate what this community has achieved and very specifically uh, within the context of the National Quantum Initiative, uh, the efforts that the Department of Energy is leading in constructing this new national effort. And that the launch of the five uh, DOE, National Quantum Information Science Centers is, is really you know, a fantastic uh, achievement uh, for, for the United States. And I had an opportunity with Undersecretary Damar to, to be able to, to celebrate this and in terms of IBM's participation, we take enormously seriously the need for industry to collaborate and partner broadly with the national laboratories and with, the, and with academia as well. And we're delighted that we're participating in three uh, of the five uh, centers. And you see the participation here listed on the right. And we look at it as a set of complementary activities that is gonna help us to push the boundaries on topics as fundamental as quantum error correction, quantum interconnects, and hardware aware applications for a quantum advantage. And also very importantly for all of us to work together to, to advance this frontier for, for the nation and, and for industry. Um, I had the opportunity to uh, engage in a wonderful collaboration uh, over the last couple of months with uh, Irfan Siddiqui uh, from, from Berkeley and, uh, and Joe Bros. Uh, who I'm sure you know, all, all of you know. And um, we engaged in a multi-month dialogue on trying to think collaboratively representing different sectors, industry, academia, and the national laboratories, uh, and different agencies around you know, what are the elements uh, that we would like to instill uh, for this quantum future right, in, in our country. And we published a series of articles that you know, hopefully some of you have gotten a chance to read, but if not, here's a pointer. In, uh, in physics, and, uh, and I wanted to focus my remarks on highlighting some of the things we surface here in the context of the journey that we've been in in IBM uh, in quantum computing, but because perhaps I thought you know, it might be illustrative of opportunities that we all could have in common. So I'll start with, with the first, which was an introduction around the kinds of cultures that we are gonna have to bring together to be, to be successful and build a quantum industry. So I'd like to take a few minutes to unpack those ideas and put them in the lens, in the lens of, of quantum. And what we articulated on that first article was a thought that what we need to be able to bring together in our community is the best aspects of a culture of science, a culture of the roadmap, and the culture of agile. The culture of science, um, you know, in, I think in, in this audience and, and uh, in this community needs no further elaboration. But of course, you know, I love, I love actually this quote from Kevin Kelly that talks about science suggests a process of uncommon rationality, inspire observation, and a near saintly tolerance for failure. It is of course an endeavor that, you know, aims high and that 
it seeks fundamental truths, right, through proven methods of inquiry. And of course, it needs to be at the very, very heart of the progress in the world of, of quantum information and in the creation of a, of a quantum industry. The culture of the roadmap, uh, by means of continuing the definitions, it is one that is always looking up to a vision of where we need to be three years from now, five years from now, even 10 years in the future. And it often involves committing to future targets and delivery dates without fully knowing a priori how we will reach them. It is a culture that is intensely team-oriented and unrelenting. Very often in industries that rely on roadmaps, missing the targets uh, often implies dropping out of the race. And of course, this has been you know, best exemplified by what we witnessed over many decades on the world of semiconductors, where we saw these you know, sequential aggregate levels of R&D investments that are quite spectacular and a massive amount of coordination involving the movement from node to node, like from 180 nanometers to 130 to 90 to 65, et cetera, through a tremendous amount of innovation of every possible uh, area from fabrication and lithography and etching and devices and materials and integration and packaging, et cetera, that did require indeed that level of coordination. And finally, this culture of agile, it is a culture that uh, encourages and rewards collaboration, speed and value and user-driven innovation. It's a culture that is really focused uh, on feedback uh, from the end users. It's a culture also that we have witnessed, um, you know, over now, well over a decade, focuses on the ability to create minimum viable products that allows us to iterate and interact with the market and users to understand what the next steps uh, ought to be. So with that in mind as, as course of definition, let me uh, recast like the implications of when we bring the best aspects of these cultures together and look at it then with a quantum information lens. Of course, the power of bringing cultures together perhaps is you know, wonderfully illustrated in the example of what happened with Apple and Steve Jobs where a passion of bringing together the culture of the humanities and the world of computing, um, well, sim quite simply, changed the world. And you know, in this example, this inspiration that, for example, he took in his education in Greek college uh, with Robert Palatino, Professor Palatino, as a master calligrapher, and the inspiration that then also took on how to bring together these diverse cultures to create incredible products and, and incredible capability, perhaps is a North Star to illustrate the power of bringing these different ways of thinking and methodology uh, for a common purpose. So let me look at now and share it in the context of where we are and where we're going, right? Uh, in this case, with a, an industry lens represented by IBM and share with you these elements of, of these three cultures and how we think about the program and the investments about the future of quantum. Our journey within IBM research uh, on quantum information science um, actually dates back to the very beginning of uh, the birth of quantum information theory, and I'll show some artifacts in a minute. But you know, we've been involved, uh, the research division of IBM has been around for 75 years, and we have been involved in this general area since 1970. And um, you can see, I won't read all the milestones, I've picked some selected areas of seminal or important progress in the field of quantum information and more specifically in quantum computing. And the areas where you see field dots, uh, uh, field dots uh, are examples where there's been very significant IBM participation on, on those milestones. So I thought in the context of, uh, of today's event, I will share some, some interesting artifacts that perhaps are useful from a historical perspective as well as a roadmap. For us, that very origin uh, of how we got interested uh, in, in IBM research on the world of quantum information science dates back to Rolf Landauer, uh, who in the 1960s uh, became interested at the intersection of the relationship between physics and information. And he hired at the time a young Charlie Bennett. This is a picture of Charlie now, uh, not then. And, um, and in there, they started asking questions like, is there a fundamental limit to the energy efficiency of computation? And they explored questions like, 
the, um, you know, whether information processing was thermodynamically reversible. So very sort of physics oriented questions around a lens of information and questioning some of the assumptions that Cloud Shannon had provided us around the separation of physics and information. And um, this is uh, uh, a picture of a uh, notebook entry from Charlie, which I believe is the earliest entry uh, of what these words uh, were written down, quantum information theory. And you can sort of see in the upper left-hand corner, uh, written down in 1970. And, uh, and since we have a broad community, if others have examples of uh, earlier entries or, or simultaneous entries around that, it'd be wonderful to be able to share. But sort of in unpeeling and going down this journey, you know, one of the other like, you know, celebrated moments in the field was the organization of uh, a conference called the Physics of Computation Conference that took place at Endicott House at MIT on May 6, 1981. And uh, in this uh, conference that actually was jointly organized between MIT and, and IBM Research, you see uh, here the connection, here's a picture of, of Ralph Landauer. Of course, famously the keynote uh, speaker of that conference was uh, Richard Feynman where is where, you know, the very famous quote that we always all use in the context of nature not being classical and the amazing opportunity that we would have if we could build machines that behave like nature to be able to model nature as kind of like the origins of, of the idea and the possibilities of building quantum computing took place. And, um, and what I thought it, you know, also is, is, is of general interest historically here the reason you don't see Charlie here is because Charlie was the one that, you know, he loves to take, uh, he, he loves to be uh, a photographer and he's the one that actually, uh, you know, took, took this picture. As um, in going down, down that journey, um, they began also an exploration uh, and it happened, you know, also of course, uh, broadly in the field of exploring some of the implications for the world of communications. And here the question that was uh, being asked then in the 1980s was whether quantum uncertainty could be harnessed to facilitate secure communication by betraying the presence of an eavesdropper. And um, in, in that notion of how that could be done, the first experimental apparatus that is here in, the, in, in Yorktown in the building in, in Charlie's office uh, is the work that, you know, that he did with John Smalling and, and, and collaborators. And here is in some ways the precursor of some of the very exciting, um, uh, you know, quantum internet ideas that now we're seeing uh, scale up, right? So it's interesting to see the, the origins, right, of some of these uh, early experiments. And of course, for us, within the context of advancing the foundations of quantum information science was the world of computing, right? Uh, dating from the early work uh, that took place uh, with Ike Chuang and uh, Matthias Steffen and others in, in the Almaden Research Lab uh, you know, using different technology to do a, a simple factoring of numbers to our journey down the superconducting route. And you're seeing here on the left hand side, um, you know, early devices to do, um, you know, superconducting coherence experiments in 2010 that were done here in, in Yorktown Heights. And, uh, and I illustrate this as like what an amazing progress and an amazing change can happen in a decade. Right on the right hand side, uh, you're seeing a 65 qubit, you know, package quantum processor uh, you know, based on transform qubits. And uh, as I later share the roadmap, it's a, you know, a good illustration of how much can change in a decade and uh, how much change is ahead of us. So with, with that as a sort of like a, you know, brief introduction in the context of, you know, our journey on quantum information science, and of course, our, our ongoing commitment, uh, both internally through research and the collaborations we are gonna do with academia, and in the national laboratories, um, it's really a foundational aspect of progress for us, right? Continue to invest in science uh, as a hallmark of everything that, that we do. There's a second culture that is extraordinarily important to bring into the table. And for us now in the context of a roadmap, just a few weeks ago during the IBM Quantum Summit, uh, Jay Gambetta had the opportunity to share broadly uh, with, with the you know, attendees and with the world the roadmap ahead of the next decade uh, as a means to you know, not only share and perhaps coordinate uh, activities and investments, but also uh, you know, to trigger a dialogue around the kinds of roadmaps that perhaps uh, are going to be created by all the different actors uh, who are participating in the world of quantum. And what we want to illustrate is the journey from the current kinds of devices where there's tens of qubits, like for example, 
the 27 qubit device uh, that you know are some of the flagship devices that we utilize today towards a path of building systems with you know a million qubits and, and beyond. And we share a roadmap uh, of going from you know the current present where we released in early September a 65 qubit device. We, we codenamed this family of processors after birds. So this is the Falcon and Hummingbird uh, family of processors. And then we talked that we have in development multiple generations where we would release our 127 qubit uh, system in 2021, a 433 in 2022, over a thousand qubit device, uh, you know, called in Condor uh, by 2023. And that we also felt that that would be, you know, an important inflection point in, in the field. And there's a lot of scientific and technical challenges to be able to execute um, a roadmap. I, I like to say that a roadmap is not just uh, you know, a plan and some PowerPoints, right? And roadmaps are execution, right? And the commitment to see things through and the organizational capacity uh, to carry them out. And you know, in this case, uh, you know, just to highlight very briefly some of the techno highlights in terms of you know, optimizing uh, lattice connectivity in the case for our superconducting devices, and also the ability to uh, re remove um, you know, uh, crosstalk and, uh, and challenges with that uh, with introduction of a laser annealing technique to increase uh, the yield and the frequency tuning of the devices. Um, as we go down the journey of uh, having built now the 65 qubit device, here we're introducing in terms from a system perspective, read up multiplexing with uh, you know, now improved ratios of eight to one in single lines as well as low latency uh, signal processing for, for these devices. And as we think ahead on 2021 to the 127 qubit, now uh, you know, the, the necessity to introduce um, you know, uh, superconducting through silicon vias, as well as spurious mode mitigation and multi-level wiring and introduction of real-time uh, classical compute. And as we go and scale to larger devices, um, the introduction of additional technologies that, that you see here in terms of you know, cryo infrastructure and control and cryo flex cables, ultimately leading to, um, you know, this, the Condor device with over a thousand qubits, where of course the biggest and most difficult challenge is reducing the error rates uh, by about a factor of a hundred X lower than we typically see today in state of the art uh, machines for superconducting devices. And associated uh, with this, we also release you know, in, in executing a roadmap, you've got to work on many technologies simultaneously, both the present, next year, two years, three years, five years from now, all at the, at the same time with different levels of effort, of course, but requires sort of concurrent uh, development. Otherwise, you never get there in time. And we also release, um, you know, an experimental environment that we have designed and we have built to be able to house environments uh, of up to a million qubits, this uh, so-called super fridge. Uh, that is 10 feet wide, I mean 10 feet tall and six feet, six feet wide, weighs about 8,000 pounds, and it's going to take about 14 days to, to cool down. And I thought I would include like this uh, fun picture of, um, you know, Jay Gambetta as Hans Solo uh, in, uh, you know, in our super fridge. So, and of course, as we continue going down this road uh, to, you know, ever larger systems and devices, the need for cryo CMOS technologies and reducing the qubit footprint. In this case, we're seeing, uh, you know, a one micron by one micron uh, transmond device, uh, that, you know, that we're working on and the need to incorporate things like quantum motherboards and, and beyond. And as an example of, of, you know, one of the wonderful collaborations that we have in one of the national uh, quantum initiative uh, centers and working with the University of Chicago and others is the, you know, incredibly importance of developing quantum interconnects to build quantum intranets so that we can actually couple in the, in our case, uh, the gigahertz frequencies present in our superconducting devices with the, uh, the optical frequencies to be able to, um, you know, create these entangled systems. And in this is going to be the journey of everything from fundamental material science to uh, engineering and creating new devices. And just as an example of the kind of progress that also we're driving, you know, giving here a figure of a silicon germanium silicon optical resonator that we've been working on uh, with quality factors now uh, on the order of 157 million. So there's a lot to be uh, done here, but this is going to be an enormously important and exciting intersection between the worlds of uh, communications and, and interconnects and the world of, of computing. 
So I wanted to talk about the third pillar now. So we talked about you know, the culture of science, the culture of the roadmap, but also the culture of agile uh, and how important it is. And the recognition here, what drove us and motivates us in the way we make our investments in R&D in quantum is that the recognition that until very recently, you know, for most of history, to have a quantum device, you have to build it and maintain it yourself. And, and the number of people that could engage in uh, multi-qubit experiments, I mean, perhaps we're in the dozens, right, in terms of university, you know, leading universities, you know, and some industrial research labs and natural labs uh, around the world, but very, very limited. And of course, you know, one of the realities is that just like in the early days, running a program uh, in a computer may have looked like something on the left-hand side in the 1940s. You know, here's a picture of Jerry Chow in, a, in you know, in some of the experimental, uh, you know, quantum devices in 2015, you know, programming a quantum computer uh, looked like that too, right? So not something that was broadly available or, or accessible. And um, in May 2016, um, we were the, the first company to, to launch uh, you know, uh, a small quantum computer, a five qubit device in that case, and make it universally available uh, through, through the cloud. And this was very, very exciting because it gave the opportunity, it gave the launch of, of, of this idea of quantum computing as a, as a cloud service, and more importantly, the opportunity to start building a community and uh, I'm much, uh, you know, greatly expanded the number of people that could be exposed to quantum information ideas and, uh, and processes. So what we did, you know, very straightforward uh, from a description perspective is you could sit in front of your terminal, write your normal, you know, circuit in this case, zeros and ones. We would take that, convert those into microwave pulses, right? Uh, in this case, we operate about five gigahertz and then the signals will go down the cryostats. We would perform uh, all the, uh, you know, logical operations in our case of like superposition and interference and entanglement, be able to then amplify the signal, extract uh, the signal and return it back to the users, uh, you know, to, to get the results, right? So all, all from the comfort of, of their own homes. And when, as I was saying, what was really fascinating is to see the emergence of a community. So this is a, a visualization of all the users since May 2016 that have access to, uh, you know, at present we have built uh, 28 uh, quantum systems, uh, maybe 29, if I'm going by memory, uh, that we have field deployed in, in the IBM cloud. And these are all the users all over the world through the course of these last four years who have been learning, experimenting, conducting science, um, you know, using the quantum hardware. And to date, 360 billion quantum circuits have now been executed by this community on actual quantum hardware. And over 260,000 users uh, have engaged uh, now with, with the platform. And, uh, and so we've, we've taken this philosophy also of agility in hardware, right? To continue to build, uh, you know, improve uh, systems and devices on a quarterly basis and continuously making them available to our, to our community. Uh, because, you know, different topologies, different levels of performance, uh, drive uh, different use cases. And, and, you know, so that's been part of our commitment. And what we've also, um, you know, that what this is enabling us to do is I'll touch now on the second element of this series of, of, of essays is the opportunity to expand the idea of quantum information and make it available broadly in the world of education and skills and create a new generation of quantum natives, right? This philosophy and uh, this idea that we call quantum for all and that how quantum and the advances that this community is making is gonna actually touch very fundamental areas about how do we teach computer science, how we learn about information, and how we actually educate the next generation. So this is another area that we're enormously passionate about and we love working with everybody uh, in the community. Um, and that is to advance the world of open source. Uh, for us, it's uh, you know, through uh, Qiskit, uh, as many of you know, it's, uh, you know, an open source project to allow uh, the community to develop and program, uh, you know, and learn about the world of quantum. Um, a commitment to education, we've created uh, collaboratively also uh, open textbooks uh, for quantum computing and significant investments that we make around, you know, summer schools and training programs, as well as leadership uh, events and opportunities, um, you know, for everybody who's interested uh, in the community. Uh, running this 
Quizkit camps is actually an enormous source of joy and energy in the system. I mean, if like the, 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 the sheer amount of enthusiasm and passion that we're seeing, and I'm sure you're all observing, right, within your respective fields and institutions that, um, that you know, the next generation now has for the world of quantum is something to behold. So it's really a joy for us to be able to support and engage very broadly around the world. And just as an example, and maybe it's like, you know, I think maybe in our context, one of the, um, the uh, only positive experience of, of like pandemic world is that, uh, you know, we, we've run for a number of years now a quantum summer school. And of course this year uh, we couldn't hold it in person. So we decided to go virtual. And uh, in doing so, what has been remarkable is just the increased participation, just like under Secretary Dabar was mentioned in the context of this very event of the X Lab, right? Going from a few hundred people to thousands of people. So it was kind of a similar experience for us where instead of a couple hundred people, we ended up with over 4,000 summer uh, participants. And you can see here the participations from all over the world, right? And that over the course of a, of a two week period, uh, you know, they just greatly, greatly advanced their skill. We've also been very proud um, to, uh, to extend the partnership broadly and making sure that the quantum uh, industry and the quantum area is one area that is also characterized for its commitment to diversity and inclusion. And we announced um, a few weeks back uh, a fantastic partnership uh, in the creation of the IBM uh, HBCU, the Historic Historically Black Colleges and Universities Quantum Center led by Howard University, but incorporating 13 HBCUs um, to have a very, very significant program uh, devoted to quantum research and education and training uh, for this. So we're, we're very, very excited to continue, um, you know, to advance this opportunity with our HBCU colleagues. So I'll touch now on the, um, on the third and, and last element, which is to realize a full quantum industry is going to be absolutely critical um, that we scale. And and, and for that is the broadened participation on more and more institutions. Um, the QEDC is a wonderful example of the partnerships that are being possible right now and how many stakeholders we can bring to the table. That means of example, I'm sharing here all the participants since we launched the IBM Q network a couple of years ago. These are all the institutions who have joined the IBM Q network to have access to differentiated quantum systems and to collaborate and do research together and explore a whole variety of use cases in the context not only of universities but of industry. So it's been remarkable to see we have now over 120 partners. And you're seeing across the broad areas where we know quantum will ultimately make a difference like simulating quantum systems. So that will matter of course to the world of chemistry and materials and ultimately the life sciences. The world of artificial intelligence, um, you know, exemplified by, you know, uh, ways to be able to advance, for example, uh, you know, linear algebra and solving sparse matrices, as well as the world of quantum walks and uh, that would have, you know, direct impact to uh, the world of risk uh, as an example. So you're seeing here as a proxy and illustration of industry partners that work with us, the variety of use cases on the left hand side that are being explored and where joint research and joint publications are being carried out. So this is in anticipation of a future where we can overcome by delivering on our roadmap uh, and make enough progress that we can begin solving problems of practical value to the world that you could not solve exclusively with uh, classical computing. In this world of partnerships, I think it's also extremely important uh, that we continue to collaborate and partner uh, also with our allies around the world. Uh, we've been very proud to, to create national level partnerships with Germany and, uh, and with Japan also on this topic of quantum information and quantum computing and to design programs collaboratively with the national governments around technology access, education and skills, research, as well as uh, economic and industrial uh, development. So, um, you know, as a, as a last element about thinking about scale, Perhaps, you know, as a means of illustration, we've gone from the early 2010s, I gave the number of maybe dozens of labs perhaps could engage at manipulating qubits. Since the launch of the IBM quantum experience in May 2016, we saw within a week of, of that launch, thousands of people now could engage in multi-qubit experiments remotely. We've now seen that four years later, you know, we're engaging tens of thousands or even 100,000 uh, folks that can engage in those kinds of experiments. Um, but you know, moving forward, 
we're going to want eventually to get to the point where millions of software developers can benefit from quantum. It's worth remembering that there's about like 25 million people in the world that earn a living writing code, right? And those 25 million in writing uh, all their applications in turn touch the lives of billions of people. So ultimately, we're going to want to go and make you know, this idea of frictionless development available for sure for the people who are kernel developers and algorithmic developers who have deep expertise in the world of quantum. But we're gonna want for make quantum available for the people that don't want to know quantum or don't need to know quantum. And therefore the ability to be able to describe the problem in a way that they can incorporate in their Jupyter notebooks or in their traditional programming environment without having to learn a new language, like in this case, solving an optimization problem. So as much as many of us love this world, right, of seeing this physical hardware and the advances that we need to make and all the layers of the stack, for this community, they want the hardware to go away and disappear. And ultimately what they want to be able to do is program in their favorite language and get the benefit of, of quantum. So in this future, what we'll have is people will sit in front of their terminal and the unit of consumption will be quantum circuits. And behind the scenes on, uh, on the cloud, the right optimized quantum circuit uh, will be designed and compiled and executed across a fleet of quantum hardware environments and returned back to the user you know, in the form of the return of the library call or the quantum circuit that has been executed on. So, we will see this and we will see this as an example done of once we have quantum runtimes, they'll be embedded everywhere. And here's an example of embedding a quantum runtime uh, running an actual quantum hardware in Excel, right? Where the trigger of the calculation is gonna happen, you know, with total transparency as far as the user is concerned. So ultimately that is the path to be able to touch on millions of people. So let me close now with a final reflection that we are witnessing a revolution in computing. And the intersection of all the advances of the world of bits and the progress we've made over many, many decades, uh, you know, thanks to the building blocks that Cloud Shannon and Alan Turing gave us and Moore's Law over decades, combined with um, neurons and neural networks and the inspiration that we have derived from biology as a means to process information and the modern world of AI, and the intersection of the world of physics and information represented as a world of qubits and modern day quantum systems, that each of these elements will have enormous value in their own rights. But perhaps the most profound implication of all of this will be what will happen this decade to the convergence of bits, neurons, and qubits coming together, which will be all orchestrated through a hybrid cloud fabric and assisted through AI assisted programming. And the ultimate power of the combination of these tools will be a new ways to accelerate scientific discovery and a creation of a whole new generation of intelligent mission critical applications. And look, I think it goes without saying in the context of a middle of a pandemic that we have not run out of problems to solve in the world and that we could really use the help. And it's gonna be thanks to this amazing community that is making this possible that we have an opportunity to make an enormous difference to the world. Thank you.